Hi, everyone. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy news journalist for over 20 years now. And in addition to all of the work that we're doing, reporting all the stories, sometimes to try to give you a behind the scenes look, conversations with the researchers who are actually generating, doing the research that we're reporting on. And today I'm uh, pleased to be joined by Dr. Renu Mahotra. Dr. Mahotra, welcome to the show. Thank you, Fraser. Happy to be here. So, I came across your latest paper on on archive, as I do, um, talking about the dynamics of Pluto, and it's uh, you had a great, a very uh, thrilling headline about Pluto's chaotic orbit, which I thought was which I thought was great. Um, uh, we reported on, on Universe Today, and it was probably the most popular story that we've had on Universe Today in the last probably this month. Uh, there was something in that story really kind of touched a nerve, excited people. It was really interesting. And actually, I get a ton of questions here on Universe Today just about, about orbital mechanics and the stability of the solar system and three body interactions and Lagrange points. And it just goes on and on and on. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to get an expert. We're going to talk about all this stuff, dig deep, and hopefully together we'll all understand it like a little bit better. So, who are you and, and what do you do? Who am I? Oh, okay. gosh, that's an existential question. You can take uh, it as existential as you need. Yeah. Well, okay, I'll, I won't make it ex existential. So um, professionally, I'm a professor at the University of Arizona. I've been here about uh, since since the year 2000. I've been on the faculty in the Department of Planetary Sciences, also known as the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. Um, my area of expertise is uh, orbital dynamics, solar system dynamics. Uh, I have over my career studied uh, the orbital mechanics of um, various, uh, various parts of the solar system, uh, moons of uh, planets, um, small bodies throughout the solar system, asteroids, uh, Kuiper belt objects, comets, and uh, also uh, studying uh, and have studied exoplanets, planets around other stars. So my area is about studying the, the uh, dynamics of uh, orbits in planetary systems. Uh, and of course, the research goes beyond the, what, we, what everybody's familiar with, which is known as the Kepler problem or the Kepler solution, which is that orbits are ellipses. But there's a lot more to orbits beyond the elliptical model that uh, we are all familiar with. So let's start with the research with the paper that you recently published uh, about Pluto's orbit. What what were you sort of studying and announcing in your paper? So uh, Pluto has a, a very peculiar orbit. It has many properties that are really difficult to uh, accommodate, if you like, within uh, our understanding of the solar system. And this particular paper, we looked at one additional thing. So there are some basic things we understand about Pluto. But there are many things that we don't. And uh, the, mo the particular motivation uh, that we started off, at least in, uh, in this latest research, was uh, to understand Pluto's orbital inclination better. Where does it come from? So Pluto's orbit is quite inclined to the plane of the solar system, to the more or less common plane of the planets. And uh, we have a partial understanding of where that inclination comes from, but it's only partial. And I was trying to push that further to get to a more complete understanding. Now I'll tell you off the off the, off the bat that we didn't actually understand. We didn't make a whole lot of progress <laughs> in understanding right. where Pluto's inclination comes from. But we got a little glimmer of the a possibility of what that mechanism might be. And part of that mechanism has to do with the perturbations on Pluto from uh, what, are, what we think of as the inner giant planets. The outermost one is, of course, Neptune. And Neptune's role on Pluto's um, orbital dynamics has been, there's a well understood theory for Neptune's role, direct role on uh, Pluto's orbit. But the role of the other planets was not very well understood. And I think we made some progress and got some new insights into what that role is that Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus play 
in Pluto's orbital dynamics. And it was kind of surprising. Well, I mean, one of the things that's always so interesting, and I remember this from my childhood, is that Pluto and Neptune switch places in distance to the sun. And for about 20 years, Pluto is closer to the sun than Neptune and it crosses Neptune's orbit. And yet, obviously, the two have been doing this dance for billions of years, and they don't crash into each other. Pluto is still there. How how is that possible? So that is, um, that is Neptune's direct influence on Pluto and vice versa, you could say to some extent. Um, that's possible because of this orbital resonance condition, where Pluto's orbital period is very darn close to a three halves ratio with uh, Neptune's. So for every three times that Neptune goes around the sun, Pluto goes around twice. Okay, and they and because of this very small integer ratio of their orbital periods, um, the gravity of Neptune can uh, impart just enough angular momentum and energy and exchange that with uh, with Pluto that it can keep Pluto crossing Neptune's orbit at a location at a longitude where which is really far away from when Neptune is. Um, where Neptune is in its orbit at the time that Pluto crosses Neptune's orbit. Okay, so it's a timing thing. It's like dancers, literally, you know, the dancers are not stepping on each other's toes, even though they're in the same orbit about each other. We see these resonances similar with Jupiter and its moons, and I'm, I'm going to assume their resonance with other giant planets and their and their moons. Is it that the the dominant gravitational object is shaping the orbits of the other bodies? Or is it sort of what is left? Survivor bias, I guess. Ah, okay, yes. So in the case of Pluto, um, I think that it's probably a bit of both actually equal almost equally, uh, both potentially, uh, there is um, um, a very strong um, shepherding effect from Neptune. So Neptune is actually shepherding Pluto's orbit. Um, and it possibly, it, we think we have theoretical models or theoretical ideas that um, argue that um, this kind of shepherding actually started off long ago during the process when the whole solar system was forming. And um, during that process, during that formation process, and right after when the solar system was still rather young and uh, full of a lot of uh, leftovers of planet formation, um, Pluto got shepherded into this resonance. So it didn't start out being in this resonance with Neptune. It actually gradually and very systematically, its orbit got shepherded into this resonance. And uh, a lot of such, you know, Pluto-like and even smaller, so possibly some bigger objects, uh, but most likely many, many smaller objects got shepherded in this way into this resonance with Neptune. And we see them. We, we see hundreds of objects in the same re mm. resonance sharing this orbit uh, that Pluto has, which is shepherded by Neptune. So there was definitely a systematic shepherding effect that pushed Pluto, Pluto into this resonance. But quite likely, um, many objects got pushed so far that they actually got, um, they fell out of resonance as well. They got, a, they got push, pushed a little too far to the point where they were really unstable and they, um, and they kind of uh, got knocked out of the resonance. So there is some survivor bias in that sense that Pluto didn't get pushed so far that it got thrown out of the resonance or dropped out of the resonance. So there is that survivor bias, but there was a systematic push in the solar system to to capture objects into these uh, resonant orbits. And, and in your paper, you you mention that over the large scales, Pluto has remained largely stable in the past and will remain so in the future. But on the small scale, there is a lot of chaos going on. Which parts of its orbit are shifting and, and what's that due to? And I guess how far can it go? I think what you're asking me is what does it mean that Pluto's orbit is chaotic on some at some level? Mm -hmm. And so this result comes from numerical simulations. So if you take Pluto uh, and propagate its orbit 
with all the forces that we understand that are acting on it, mainly the primarily the gravitational forces from from the other planets, well, the sun, of course, but then the gravitational forces from the other planets, if we propagate its orbit for billions of years, both forward in, in the future and in the past, um, that there's interesting things that we find. So one is if you take just slightly different initial conditions, all within the observational um, uh, uncertainties of its orbital parameters, Okay, within the error ellipse of the or orbital parameters as best as we know them, um, those, those uh, clones of Pluto's will diverge and they will diverge exponentially. Okay, so, so their divergence is exponential and that's the hallmark of chaos mathematically, that the divergence is exponential in time as opposed to something that is regular which, will, which can also diverge. You can start off two objects in very close conditions and their orbit, their orbital paths would, will diverge over time, but the divergence will not be exponential. It'll be more of a power law in time. And that's the mathematical distinction between chaos and regular divergence. So for Pluto, we find with these simulations that nearby initial conditions will diverge exponentially. But then we also find that uh, if you keep carrying this on, so the time scale of that divergence, so there's a, the, the exponential time scale is only some millions of years, maybe 20 million years or so. Hmm. Okay. Now, if you keep propagating these, uh, these clones of Pluto's for billions of years, it turns out that they st their general shape and orientation of the orbit remains the same. What you lose or where they diverge is more like within the same orbit, they're going to be at slightly at different locations. Okay, so that's that's the gist of that uh, divergence. So actually, in in uh, uh, in simulations, you find that there's this exponential divergence, and then it saturates. Okay, so after some giga years of time, it doesn't uh, the the distance between the um, the the clones doesn't increase uh, doesn't keep increasing. So it increases exponentially, and then it saturates. And so this has come to be known as uh, stable chaos. Uh, in uh, orbital <laughs> dynamics. So there's some chaos, but it's, you know, you lose some phase information, you know, exactly where you are in the orbit, but the shape and orientation of the orbit is pretty, uh, continues to remain more or less what it was. And, and is this due to Neptune's influence, as you say, shepherding it? Like, if it wasn't uh, for Neptune, so would it be just... Not, no, if, if it was just Neptune, we wouldn't find this. So we can do simulations with just mm. Neptune. Neptune's gravity, and no, in that case, it's not. It's not. Uh, you don't find the ex this exponential divergence. So it's really the collective effects of all the planets, the, all the giant planets. So, so I think that I think that answered a bunch of the questions I had about the paper, and I'd love to just shift to more orbital mechanics in in general, and and we'll see how far this this rabbit hole goes. So, how stable is the solar system? today? Mm. Um, it's pretty darn stable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've heard today, that how long, what time some, scale? So when well, you ask that question, Fraser, you have yeah. to tell me what time scale oh, but, uh, you worry about giga years. I mean, you know, feel free to, to push the like, like, I've heard that there's a non zero chance that Plu that Jupiter will kick out uh, various planets in the solar system, especially inner worlds at some point. And I've also heard that, say, over the like really long time scales, long after the sun is dead, that Jupiter will kick out all the planets over a certain okay. period of time. How yeah. stable is it in sort of the lifetime of the sun? So uh, even in the lifetime of the sun, the solar system uh, for the most part is, I would say it's pretty darn stable. Now, um, there have been these simulations that Mercury's orbit is vulnerable, that uh, we really cannot predict very far into the future if Mercury is going to hang around, is going to remain, that, that's Mer that Mercury's orbit is unstable. Um, and that that is uh, a result that is a pretty confident result with numerical simulations. So Mercury's orbit, it's kind of you can, it's interesting. So you have uh, you know Neptune and then Pluto beyond Neptune, 
but then the innermost planet, Mercury, the smallest planet in the inner solar system, is also vulnerable to chaotic dynamics. And uh, its chaos doesn't appear on very short time scales. Its chaos also manifests in numerical simulations on time scales of millions, tens of millions of years. Um, and in the case of Mercury, somewhat different than in the case of Pluto, um, its orbital shape and orientation of its orbit are not so stable when you take nearby initial conditions and propagate them over time. But still, I think uh, the to find those drastically unstable orbits takes a lot of sleuthing in initial conditions. So we cannot guarantee that Mercury will not do something really terrible in the next 100 million years, like, you know, go, go having close encounters with uh, Venus and then unravel the whole solar system by, you know, perturbing Venus's orbit. Sure. You know, if Mercury were to, if its orbit were to become somewhat more eccentric, it would have greater perturbations on Venus, which would then transmit to Earth's orbit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so it can be this chain reaction that can happen. And we cannot guarantee, I think, with the simulations that have been done, that this is out of the question. But it seems to be a pretty, you know, if you take some distribution of initial conditions, there's only a very tiny, tiny fraction of those that actually manifest into, manifest as this catastrophic instabilities. So I'd like to assure people that uh, it's highly unlikely, but it, there's no guarantee. It's like the, you know, like the, uh, the markets, you know, Wall Street, the Dow Jones Industrials. We can't, no one's going to guarantee you that it won't fall uh, by 2,000 points tomorrow, right? It's, it's possible. And, and so Mercury could, in sort of the best case scenario, be hurled into the sun. And in the worst case scenario, unravel the orbits of the planets one by one causing it to be a giant game of cosmic billiards, but probably not. Um, okay, so will it, um, okay, if it drops into the sun, um, if it actually ends up uh, happening that Mercury's orbit gets sufficiently elliptical, more elliptical than it is already, that it falls into the sun, then you're almost guaranteed that it will have also uh, <laughs> run havoc on right. Venus and oh, okay. so we're not going to be left uh, unscathed if Mercury is to fall into the sun. Um, so the research that that I've been reading is that the migration of the planets, you know, we know that it's kind of weird that the separation of the planets are different from how where they formed that it looks like Uranus and Neptune switch places, it looks like Uranus was pushed onto its side, there was a lot of migration and changes that happened at some point in the beginning of the solar system. Mm -hmm. Is the thinking that that happened quickly or slowly now? Where are we at in the, you know, in the Nice model and just sort of our general thinking about about how the planets found themselves in the positions they are today? I think um, the constraints we have are still rather Um, fuzzy uh, on how long that uh, period of uh, chaos, strong chaos, you know, where planets were changing or their orbits very drastically before they settled down into this more, what is a fairly stable, uh, surprisingly stable, I would say, planetary system. Um, that the time scale of that settling down, I think, still remains not very well constrained. Hmm. Um, by my okay, so this is this is my um, judgment that all the evidence that we have suggests that it took several hundred million years. In other words, the planets probably were more or less pretty close to their present uh, orbital configuration by about four billion years ago as opposed to the age of the solar system, which is about 500, 600 million years, um, more than 4 billion years. So about 4.5 billion years is the age of the solar system. 
And the first 500 to 600 million years, in my judgment, were that period of settling. And uh, many big changes were happening to the planets at that time. So is, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I've, I mean, I've heard that it could have happened dramatically faster than that, that it could be on the order of hundreds of thousands, low millions of years, that the dynamics could be, as these planets are feeding on material and as they're shifting their orbits, it could be surprisingly quick. But I'm, I, I wasn't sure sort of where we stood, where the, the bulk of the research stands on that point right now. So certainly, you know, very quickly, meaning, say, the first 10, 10, 20, 30 million years were possibly way more dramatic. And then the next, you know, factor of 10, the next three to 600 million years um, was not as dramatic, but I think it was still, a lot, our solar system would have looked a lot more different than what we recognize it today in those um that a few hundred million year time scale. Uh, and I'll give you one, one piece of evidence uh, that we, that in my mind is very strong and it's perhaps been suppressed some or forgotten maybe um, in uh, recent times. And that is the age of the surface of the moon. So the moon, we, you know, we have samples of the surface of the moon. How soon did, mo did the moon solidify. So we think that it started off as a practically, you know, as the, the um, aftermath of a giant impact between protoplanets uh, that eventually formed the Earth and the Moon. And uh, then so it was formed in a very uh, hot state and its surface then cooled off, solidified and uh, retained uh, uh, and has retained uh, subsequent uh, evidence of bombardment over the past you know, 400 or four plus billion years. Um, so that the, if you, so the evidence from, from what we understand about how this surface of the moon solidified, it, it all that, and this comes from cosmochemistry and looking at uh, radio, radiogenic isotopes and their relative abundances. What we learned from that is that the, so that the crust of the moon solidified in the first 30 million years, okay, so wow. uh, so very very quickly. Yeah. Um, but then it was uh, it was like it was uh, pounded over again, very highly, very strongly, about um, 500 million years later. So it was like all those radioisotope systems were mixed up. Um, they were initially set at you know something like let's say four point. Um, uh, four billion years ago, uh, just in round num numbers, and then about 500 million years later, they were all crunched, you know, um, pounded and uh, mixed up all over again. And so that's where I, my judgment comes from that, that I think that after that, there was no major regurgitation of anything on the surface of the moon. There were, you know, smaller impacts going on, of course, throughout history but nothing catastrophic that completely churned up, churned up the entire surface of the, of the moon. And so I think that is the one data point we have in terms of time scales that I, I find very compelling. Does your sort of interest in exoplanet research and the incredible number of like newly forming planetary systems that we see out there, do you think we'll get better answers by examining the formation of, of other star systems? Oh, we certainly will. Um, we are already, there are already some um, systems we know of where there are, um, you know, brightening of the dust, um, um, the, the dust creation and density in those uh, protoplanetary disks, you know, time dependent uh, brightening on our time scale, on time scales of orbital periods, which might be undergoing this kind of giant impacts as we speak. Um, so I think those, uh, those kinds of observations are gonna become better and better over the next years, decades perhaps, but so even years. And uh, we'll learn, we'll actually be able to watch to some extent planet formation in real time going on. It's very exciting, it's a very exciting time. Yeah, I mean, I was just talking uh, 
with a friend today about this, that, you know, there are 20, there's, there's images released from say Alma, where you look at it, just a grid of 25 newly forming planetary systems. And you can see the, the shapes of the, of the different protoplanetary disks around them and the variety that's out there. And you can say, Oh, there's a planet carving out a gap over there and another one over there. And I mean, thanks to big surveys, you you get to a point where you can study 100,000 of them or whatever, right? And, and, and then start to make some really concrete decisions. How, how difficult is it or how far into the future can you predict potentially hazardous asteroid impacts? Where so, does the chaos um, take over? Uh, yes. Yeah, so with the near Earth asteroids, the asteroids that roam around, you know, more or less, you know, share the the orbital space with Earth. Um, we have, uh, you know, JPL is keeping track of uh, the orbits of these asteroids as as we discover them and as our databases increase. Um, those orbits, if you have enough data, it's always uh, you know, data is always the limitation. If you have enough observations you can propagate the orbit pretty confidently. Um, and for all the big major, you know, the bigger of the near Earth asteroids, uh, they've been propagated uh, over, over at least the next century. And uh, there's significant, I would say significant confidence that there's no really big asteroid in near Earth space that's gonna collide with the Earth over the next century. Smaller ones have more potential in, the, in that for two reasons. One, they're small, because they're small, they're faint. And so we have uh, fewer observations and the uncertainty of the observations is bigger. The error bars are bigger. And that means our uncertainties propagate into how confident we are uh, in, in, in their uh, collisions with the earth. And uh, so, um, so when I say small, so I think uh, the, the accepted practice is that anything, um, any asteroid that's bigger than about 140 meters in uh, diameter is potentially hazardous. Right. You know, we don't actually always measure the sizes of asteroids. What we really measure is how bright they are. And that, so we translate that, translate the size to a brightness. And so that brightness, so there's some limit uh, to, the, to, the bright, to the numbers of asteroids we can follow that are very faint. So these potentially hazardous asteroids, uh, we know about uh, some numbers of them and uh, uh, we can propagate them quite readily for the most part for at least up to a century. If, if I was to fly out and put a retro reflector on each and every asteroid bigger than 140 meters in, you know, potentially hazardous regions of the, of the solar system, and you could then crunch that data with a supercomputer. How far into the future do you think you could be, you could reasonably confidently understand how safe or in danger we are? Okay, so we have to be very careful with that. We have to, we need a lot more data on, on any individual asteroid. To be There's a retroflect on every single one and you're getting beautiful data for their exact orbital, um, their exact orbits. Yes. Okay. So um, if you get uh, perfect uh, orbital data, then you have to think about the chaos. How much yeah, and that's what I'm getting. Information at. you lose, do you lose with the with the chaos? And the timescales for divergence from chaos are actually for the near Earth asteroids tend to be on the order of uh, centuries. Wow. So they're relatively short. Yeah. So in other words, even if you had absolutely perfect data, you knew precisely where an asteroid was within a few centimeters and knew where it was going, you still couldn't make any firm predictions beyond yeah. a few centuries to where it's going to be. Near, yes, for the near Earth asteroids that are in these orbit, you know, whose orbits are crossing that of the Earth. Yes, those timescales are actually, those chaotic timescales are pretty short. Mm -hmm. Is it more... Like the, the less massive the asteroid, the more the chaos creeps in? The less massive the asteroid, not so much, not over this range of sizes of asteroids. No, it's almost size independent. So even the kilometer class asteroids mm -hmm. have chaos. So you can never stop watching the sky. Yes, you got to be alert. 
all yeah. the time. Uh, yeah, you can't sleep. That's interesting. Huh. And like, I know that that Earth is is responsible to a big extent to the chaos that's happening to the asteroids that are in this region. Jupiter is pushing them at us, uh, which is kind of unfair. Um, and then I guess we're clearing them up as we either eat them or kick them back out again. Like, so and you know, it's, you know, you, as humans, we want to be able to identify individual uh, individuals that we can blame for this for this thing or that thing now you just said that uh, jupiter is pushing these asteroids at us i wouldn't put the blame entirely on jupiter okay i don't know this is this might be a silly thing um but um saturn is actually what's making jupiter do different things than it would if saturn weren't there if jupiter were just in a circular uh, you know, orbit that wasn't ever changing, then it wouldn't be able to push the asteroids at us. The oh. asteroids that, that were pushed uh, or that could be pushed have already been pushed. So those, uh, you might, you know, your audience might also know about these Kirkwood gaps in the asteroid belt and uh, these resonances, orbital resonances, where Jupiter kicks asteroids uh, out of the asteroid belt and, and then they, some of them, and end up being the near Earth asteroids. But the reason Jupiter is able to do that is because Saturn is kicking Jupiter around. <laughs> so there's a lot of blame right. to share. And Saturn is doing it because Uranus is is all of them giving are, it a shove. Yeah. Yeah, all of them are kicking each other. So there's huh. a lot it's all collective responsibility here. So so if we removed planets, we would make the solar system safer. <laughs> Um, yeah, you made that comment that eventually every Jupiter is going to be the only one surviving in the solar system. You know, yes, that is the end state. The in time going to infinity, um, that's the end state of a stable system. The two body problem, where you have only two bodies. That's true. That's interesting. Now I know that the sun is you know is just one star in the milky way it is making relatively close passes to other stars in some cases surprisingly close within uh 10,000 astronomical units even closer sometimes over millions even billions of years what what impact do you think close passes with other star systems have had on the history of the solar system mm, that's a good question so one of the things um or oh, that's a somewhat unanswered question, I would say, all the different aspects of um, the role of these close, pla close um, passes of other stars. One of the things we understand reasonably well is that uh, they played a very important part in uh, creating this Oort cloud of comets that surrounds the solar system. So these comets, are, th are uh, our understanding is that these comets actually were these planetesimals that formed in the disk that made the solar system planets, which means that they formed somewhere in, you know, a few tens of astronomical units from the sun, up to, let's say, 100 astronomical units or so. And then they were kicked out into, into highly elliptical orbits with aphelion that kept getting farther and farther. And this was kicking by the planets. So by mainly the big planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And, um, but these planets are not enough to create the Oort cloud. They can toss these planetesimals out, but the planetesimals keep coming back mm. because they are in these orbits. So, so they, you want to circularize their orbit. The perihelion keeps coming back to where it was. So the passing stars actually circularize the orbits and lifted up the perihelion. Okay, so if there's a, there's a perihelion and aphelion, and if you circularize the orbit, you circularize it somewhere in between the perihelion and the aphelion. And that, that tends to be very far for these comets. And that's how the Oort cloud was created. So these very elliptical orbits got circularized at very large distances. And now we have pretty strong evidence that the whole solar system is surrounded by this uh, isotropic spherical cloud of uh, comets at very large distances, distances of something like 10, 20,000 astronomical units. What's in between, oddly enough, we don't understand so well. We don't have observational, you know, right. so we can we have evidence of the Oort cloud at 10, 20,000 astronomical units. We have evidence or we can observe um, Kuiper belt objects 
trans-Neptunian objects out to several hundred astronomical units. Actually, we can actually observe them only up to about a hundred astronomical units. Um, and what's in between 100 and that 10,000 astronomical units, we have much less knowledge of. Okay, so to get back to your question, so we understand the, the role that the passing stars have played in producing this Oort cloud over the age of the solar system, possibly actually very early on. Um, but beyond that, we, we don't have a, a lot of other things that we've identified that have been affected by passing stars. One possibility is that this planetesimal disk uh, might have been truncated by passing stars. Okay, so, so the fact that our, all our planetary system is within 100 astronomical units of the sun might be a consequence of a closed stellar passage that truncated the disk so that uh, planets couldn't form farther out. Hmm. I, I, it's kind of, I mean, when you think about how many objects, I mean, we think about how many long period comets have made their way into the inner solar system during uh, recorded astronomical time. And it's a lot, then mm -hmm. there must be a countless number of those objects out there. And each one has a story that it had some sort of three body interaction with a planet in the inner solar system was kicked out into this high orbit, and then some passing star helped circularize its its orbit. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. That's it's mind bending to think just how many of these interactions must have happened. And yet the solar system itself is largely coherent. I mean, we don't have any evidence that a star came within a few hundred astronomical units of the sun like that would have caused mayhem. That's right. Yeah, we don't have any strong evidence of that. But, um, you know, the this formation of the Oort cloud, uh, there are two, I, I, uh, I should have mentioned that, there are two ways that uh, the Oort cloud, the two mechanisms that have produced the Oort cloud. One is these passing stars that come close enough, but there's also the overall um, gravitational field of the galaxy. So as the sun moves around the galaxy, it samples different uh, amounts of uh, overall gravity of the of the all the stars in the galaxy and uh, that collective effect of gravity also helps to circularize the orbits so it's not only the close passages of stars but also that whole collective gravitational field of the galaxy and they are roughly comparable in um, in their effects hmm. so both stars and the and the collective effects uh, help to circularize the orbits of uh, the long period comets. That's really but interesting. I, I would say it's not actually necessarily countless, because we have a finite number of stars in right. the galaxy. So we can actually count and <laughs> estimate numbers about how many close passages we've had of stars. And what is the distribution of the impact, the impact distances or collision distances. And uh, yes, it seems like it would be astronomically small to have a, a passage, a closed encounter with a passing star uh, on the order of a few hundred astronomical units, but not impossible. But I guess when I think about the collective gravity of the entire Milky Way, and each time this comet makes its approach out to perihelion, it, it starts to kind of shift on the gravitational hill between the power of the sun to pull it back down and the collective power of the entire Milky Way to try to give it a bit of a circularizing of its orbit. And mm -hmm. each one, it's just this nonstop weathering. I'm trying to think of a, of a term, but it's like this nonstop circularizing from the collective gravity of all of the, the objects in the entire Milky Way. It's kind of inevitable, just orbit after orbit after orbit. You're going to spend most of your time not at aphelion or perihelion. You're going to spend most of your time in between, and that's where you're going to get the pull from the collective stars of the of the Milky Way. Well, actually, you know, you spent these comets. They spend most of their time at aphelion because that's where their speeds really slow down, mm -hmm. and so that's why the collective effects of the galaxy can be can accumulate. Because that's really neat. Thank yeah. you. That's wonderful. Um, how Triton. How, how do you get tritons? How do you get tritons? Yeah. Well, 
I mean, yeah. Triton goes backwards from the from the rest of the moons in the solar system. Yes. Um, so I think the idea there is that it was captured from it was a for, formerly a trans Neptunian object, a hyperbelt object that ha had a close encounter, close passage to Neptune and uh, got drawn in by, uh, so there, there are a couple ideas about there that it was a three body interaction. So if you think of Nep um, uh, Neptune and Triton and a, another proto Triton, let's say some cousin of Titan, uh, Triton that came by um, more or less simultaneously so a pair of these objects came by simultaneously and they interacted with uh, uh, with Neptune and one of them got bound and the other one carried off the excess energy. Okay, that's called a three body interaction. It's actually pretty well uh, researched for uh, stars, these three body interactions hmm. in clusters of stars. You can very commonly have a, a binary star, have an encounter with a third star. And one of the uh, one of either the binary gets um, uh, broken apart uh, completely, or one of the, um, the the stars exchange places. One of the binaries gets kicked out, the other one gets uh, bound. Um, or if you have just three stars happen to have a collision, simultaneous collision, one of them gets uh, or binary a pair gets formed, and one gets one goes away. So these three body interactions are capable of making things like you know, solving a problem like Triton's problem. So I think it's, uh, yeah, I think there's some of that. We can't, I don't think we have the full story, but something like that seems reasonable. It's physically possible. Can moons have moons? Can moons have moons? Yeah. Um, well, in a sense, yes. Our moon has had moons from time to time. We've flown satellites around our moon so our moon has had artificial satellites around it with very little station keeping in in many cases um, so it was almost like a natural uh, orbit one could maintain there um, it's uh, i think uh, one has to look at this case by case but in most cases in the solar system for the moons of the solar system um, the stability time for moons around moons is smaller than the age of the solar system. And that's because probably your audience is, is familiar with the concept of hill radius. Mm -hmm. yeah. So moons, moons of planets orbit within a certain distance of the, of our, they are stable within a certain distance of the planet, within a certain orbital distance. And that distance uh, has to do with the, if you get far enough away from the earth, for example, the perturbations from the sun become strong. Okay? So, and that's true for any planet. So around Jupiter, for example, if you put orbit um, satellites around Jupiter, put them in bigger and bigger orbits, the solar perturbations start competing with those of the gravity from Jupiter itself. And so there's this limiting radius known as the hill radius where the solar perturbations and the uh, planetary perturbations become comparable. Um, so for a moon around another moon, that equivalent hill radius tends to be rather small. Okay, now, and so you can hold, you can put orbits that are stable there in that region, but they won't last very long. They'll, they'll become, they'll be strongly chaotic over some, some time scale, some fairly short time scale, I would say. Right. I guess uh, I, the impression that I got was that that over long time, like over the longest time scales, I guess, right before Jupiter has kicked Neptune out of orbit, you would have less gravitational interaction between the planets, less chances, more less chaos that's being injected into the various orbital dynamics. And so those kinds of scenarios become more possible. I mean, I think about the like the sun is the equivalent of a planet going around the center of the Milky Way and the sun has planets. So are those moons and then the moons have moons. Um, it's sort of, you know, is the Milky Way a 
planet of the center of the local group is, you know, like, like at a certain point, it's just overlapping hill spheres, hill radius is all the way down. And the, que- some extent, yeah. and the question is just, can you get a place that is that is stable? Um, but it's interesting to sort of like the is it that the longer you wait, the more these stabilities appear? Or is it you're always just stuck with them? The the more rare and weird the orbit is going to be like, say, another moon showing up and sticking around Earth for a couple of years. They're only you only get them for short periods of time. Right. So we do have from time to time, there are these things called mini moons, that Mm -hmm. your audience might have heard of mini moons. These are asteroids that temporarily become uh, moons of the Earth. And typically, they make a few swings, you know, just a few revolutions, and then they're gone. Um, oddly enough, uh, there's a, there's one interesting object right now, um, which is, uh, we call it a quasi-satellite. We don't call it a mini moon, because it's not inside the hill sphere of the Earth. Uh, it's actually outside. It's about, it's actually something like on some tens of hill spheres out. Hmm. But it's, for now, it's orbiting the Earth. And it's orbiting in a retrograde way, so opposite to the sand, opposite to the direction of the moon. It's our own moon, um, but it's many times farther away than the moon is. It's an asteroid, and uh, so as I said, it's called a quasi-satellite because it's not inside the Hill sphere, and it has a period uh, of motion around the, the orbital period um, around the Earth that it does is one year. Okay, so. It's, it's actually just coincides with the uh, motion of the Earth around the sun. Um, so that kind of orbit, it, this guy's orbit, this, this one small asteroid, its orbit turns out to be stable for something like uh, 500 years in the past and another 300 years in the future. Okay, so this is a very stable, you know, in that sense, it's much more stable than these mini moons. Hmm. Um, even though it's farther away, not even in that grip of or its uh, gravity. So, you know, and that is also, it's, there are two things to this um, for its stability. It is uh, stable in the three body model of the Earth, Moon, well, actually the four body model, the Earth, Moon, Sun, and this asteroid. And even in the three body model, if you just think about the um, Earth, uh, the Earth, Moon as one object, and uh, the sun and this object, this little asteroid, is orbiting the Earth Moon very center. Um, and it's, uh, it's very stable in this orbit. So, its instabilities are actually caused. The reason that it doesn't hang around more than a few centuries is because of all the other planets, you know, Mars and Venus and Jupiter. They kick it around a tiny bit, and it's at over after about a few centuries, it's gone. But they probably helped um, push it there in the first place. So that's a good question. We're trying to figure out what how it got there. And there are some intriguing possibilities. It might not be as obvious mm-hmm. as you think. There might be other other ways of getting these things out there. What are some interesting planetary systems that we could find out in the Milky Way that are completely different from the kind of configuration that we have here in the solar system, do you think? Multiple stars, multiple planets? How so, weird yeah, but so, stable do you think it can get out there? Yeah, so we have some number of examples of these already with the Kepler, um, the spacecraft, the Kepler spacecraft that has been that has discovered many of these uh, transiting planetary systems with multiple planets. Uh, the TESS uh, spacecraft has also discovered many of these, uh, and some ground-based uh, observatories also, of course, did did some of these early um, discoveries. So we have multiple planet systems we've discovered, and as far as we can tell, they're stable. They're, uh, and their configurations, they share one thing in common, apparently, with the solar system. Their planets tend to be pretty close to having a common plane, like the solar system planets. Um, what they don't share, most of these uh, with the solar system, is that uh, all their orbits are really small. They're crunched in into uh, into distances close to their stars, which are almost like, you know, inside the orbit of Mercury in our solar system. So these are very close in planets, typically. 
and uh, and we found hundreds of these. Uh, so they have some commonalities with the solar system and some some uh, differences with the solar system. Um, and they appear to be stable. Hmm. So there are multiple systems. So there's one actually this one, the Trappist system you might have heard of, of which course. is from neither Kepler, the Trappist one, which is from neither Kepler nor Tess. Uh, it's a different uh, uh, source or, or discovery space. Um, this system has, uh, if I remember, seven planets, and they're coplanar. They're so flat, like flatter than the solar system. Uh, their masses are more or less terrestrial mass objects, you know, one to two or some fraction of the Earth's mass to a few times the Earth's mass. And uh, they're crunched in very small orbits in you know, very close packed, and uh, they're stable for long times. Mm. So dynamically, they're stable. Yeah, it's kind of fascinating to, to think you've got these seven Earth sized planets all orbiting with resonances, various states of tidal locking, and yet tight that like if we grew up in a system like that, we would be sending astronauts to the nearby planets. I mean, depending on, on how habitable, how interesting they are. It's kind of we would colonize them all, right? Yeah, so yeah, we be so close. That. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's kind of an amazing thought to, to think about. Um, Actually, I just think there is a paper that I haven't read in detail, but it looked really interesting about um, uh, the transfer of material from one planet to, to the next in, uh, in Trappist One. Yeah, I saw it's, that too. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, we got, I got time for one last rapid fire question. What is the best Lagrange point? Oh, uh, you want my favorite? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, I can't choose between L4 and L5. They're identical. They're twin. Lagrange yeah, but there points. are many L4s and L5s across the solar system. So, like, oh, which L4 and L5? Oh, but different uh, planets. I'd say the Earth's L4 or L5. Yeah. That's my favorite. It, it is a mystery. We actually, there was a paper that I just saw just a couple of days ago that it should have more material in it than it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I what? wrote a paper about that. What's that about? That we should be looking more. Yeah, we should be yeah. doing a search. So we have some limits, some upper limits on uh, uh, how many asteroids might be lurking there at L4 and L5. And they're surprisingly loose limits. We could have hundreds of yeah. uh, asteroids there, which are of the size of, say, 100 meters, a few hundred meters even. And we wouldn't know because it's hard to observe from, from our vantage point on Earth because you have to look relatively close to the sun to yeah. find these objects. And that means that they're in the in, during the daytime and you don't you can't find asteroids in the daytime. But but could um, there be something deeper, like some situation of orbital dynamics that we don't understand that could be keeping material out of that region? Well, so the paper you saw probably was the one that um, looked into whether collision, if you have a large population of asteroids there, would collisions amongst themselves have destroyed them? Mm -hmm. And I think they came up, uh, their conclusion was that uh, to some extent, you know, all that would remain under collisions would be something like 1% of the original population. Again, you can't destroy, kick everything out. There will be that last one object that you can't kick out because it's nobody else, nobody right. to kick it out. The final survivor, yeah. yeah. And I think that's all we know, right? We only know of like one or two Earth, L4, L5 Lagrange objects. Right. And right. that seems consistent with a bully in King of the Hill in each, you know, part that's that's either smashed up or thrown on all the other ones. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for for handling all of my my rapid fire uh, orbital dynamics questions. It's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. What is the best place to keep track of the work that you're doing? Oh, my own work. Um, There's my website, um, my homepage, which is at LPL. Yeah, I put a link to that in yeah. the in the show notes. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. obviously just search for your name on archive and and see your papers. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I really appreciate it, and uh, and I hopefully that will let me now turn around and answer all of the orbital mechanic questions that I get until uh but but as soon as i start to get into unfamiliar territory then i'll, I'll reach out again so thank you okay so um you, 
I'm not staying on any. No, that's it. We're done. Right? We're done. I'm saying goodbye. Right. Thank you. Okay. Super. All right. Thank All you. Right. Appreciate your interest. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.